In this short video, I want to take on a term that's really important for fund investors to understand, but it's also important for anyone who buys shares, net asset value or NAV. So what is NAV? It's very widely quoted. It appears in the press, it appears all over uh, fund reports, research reports and so on, short for net asset value. So not surprisingly, three letter acronym NAV, vital for all kinds of investors and it represents the sum of a fund or a firm's assets less liabilities. Now I'm going to concentrate on funds here. In other videos, we'll take on how it's useful in other contexts. Okay, so balance sheet basics, what is NAV? In a nutshell, it is the difference between a firm's assets and liabilities. Now this is not the balance sheet basics video, but as a snapshot, what that means is that essentially the bigger a firm's assets, the bigger its overall NAV, the bigger a firm's liabilities. Assets, by the way, are the investments that it owns. So if you're looking at a fund, it's the portfolio of investments that the fund manager or director has bought on your behalf at their latest market value. The bigger those are, the bigger NAV. The bigger liabilities are, the smaller your NAV. Now, liabilities in a fund that's allowed to do it means debt or borrowing. So a very simple example, if a fund's got assets of, say, 100 million, all right, no liabilities, its NAV is 100 million. All right, very, very simple terms. If assets double to 200 million, that will double the NAV, all other things being equal to 200 million. All right, borrowing has the reverse effect on NAV. So if a fund's got assets of 100 and let's say borrowing of 20, then the NAV is the difference between the two, which is 80. And just worth noting, point I cover elsewhere, but just worth noting, were the fund to double its assets, as I suggested just now, to 200, still carrying debt of 20, 200 minus 20 is 180, which is more than doubling NAV. So in funds and firms that can borrow, gearing, as it's called, has the effect of boosting the overall increase in assets. But the reverse is true, all right? Funds that take on borrowing suffer in bad times. So as an investor, be on the lookout for two things. What's happening to assets under management? Hopefully they're rising over time. What's happening to the firm's overall debt or gearing level? Both key influences on the NAV number. Now, what does it tell you? It's a sign of a firm from a fund's point of view, an investment firm's overall health. Rising NAV basically is a good thing, or it means that the firm is getting its investment strategy right over time, reflects asset growth, less debt, and if you're looking at an open-ended style of fund, it actually forms the basis for telling you what your holding in the fund is worth. In other words, the firm's investments at market value are directly driving what your investment in that fund is worth at any one point in time, at the latest valuation point, as it's called. Just to illustrate that, imagine you've got a fund that sat down and valued its portfolio at 100 million. The number of units it sold to people like you investors is 100 million. Very simple math, at the next valuation point, we do the valuation, divide by the number of units, and that gives us a pound. Can you get in and out of the fund at a pound? Probably not, all right, because there may be a bid to offer spread. Now, some open-ended funds don't operate a bid to offer spread, Others do, but if there is a bid to offer spread, just bear in mind, if you're looking to buy, you'll probably pay a little bit more than the pound, all right? You'll pay the firm's offer price, as it's called. If you're looking to sell, you'll probably get a little bit less than a pound. So churning units, i.e. buying and selling them quickly, doesn't make a lot of sense in a lot of cases because you're going to suffer that spread straight away. And in this example, I've made it a, a 4p for illustration spread, okay? Now, what does that mean? In open-ended funds, your unit values are being driven directly by the NAV of the fund, and that's where NAV is very important because changes will be directly mirrored in what your holding's worth, okay? There's no premium or discount with an open-ended vehicle. Now, what I mean by that is there is another sort of vehicle, an investment trust company, okay, where yes, there's an NAV, but it's not directly driving the value of your holding in the vehicle. With closed vehicles, the value of the shares that you hold Okay, it's driven by the market, buyers and sellers. All right, they're usually listed on an exchange, it can be publicly traded in a normal way. And that means 
that the market determines what the fund is worth, not directly the underlying NAV. And that's quite an important distinction. Now, I'll come back to that in just a moment. Now, for opening your funds, be careful. All right, be careful. Once you've got your head around that basic distinction, the way that works. Some people say, well, okay, if I've got two similar funds, I'll go for the cheaper one. And cheaper I'm going to define as a smaller NAV, because that's going to presumably make the fund a little bit cheaper than one with a larger NAV, isn't it? No. All right. Usually, low NAVs reflect poor performance. And even when they don't, be a little bit careful, because very small funds, charges can eat a sort of disproportionate proportion of the overall value of the fund. So just be a little bit careful. All right, it's not always a good idea to think small in the funds world is what you're looking to invest in. With closed-ended funds, all right, the mechanism for determining the overall view the market takes of the fund is slightly different. You get this idea of a discount or a premium to NAV. What does that actually mean in practice? Well, here's a closed-ended fund that I've made up, and then we'll look at a real one. Um, in the made-up one, we've just got three years of performance. There's the NAV. That is the assets held by the fund manager. Okay, increasing gently over time. But there is the market capitalization, the, the price per share of the fund as determined by buyers and sellers. And you can see that here, the two move apart, and here the two move apart. And that's because at the end of the day, the price of the fund isn't being pegged to NAV as it would be with an open-ended fund. So here, you've got a premium opening up, and here you've got a discount opening up. And that's interesting for two reasons. It shows you quite clearly that NAV isn't directly driving completely the value of the fund as far as investors are concerned. And secondly, if you're one of those investors that looks at a discount and thinks, well, maybe one day that will close back up or even become a premium, you can look sometimes at two funds following essentially the same strategy, one open-ended, one closed-ended. And if the closed-ended vehicle is trading at a discount to NAV, remember the NAVs will be similar because they're following the same strategy, then some people would say there's an opportunity, an arbitrage opportunity, buy a fund trading at a discount and wait for that discount to close up. Because if there's a very similar fund that's open-ended, okay, well, there won't be a discount there, but has a similar NAV, similar strategy, similar management style, why has the closed-ended vehicle got a discount at all? All right, food for thought there. Cover that in more detail in another video. Now, in real life, it happens too. So I made up the previous example. Here's a real one. There is the NAV for the Whitan Investment Trust over a longer period, and there is the market capitalization. And you can see there's a gap. There's a discount established there running at about, well, looking at the real numbers, 10 to 11%. It does close up. You can see it just happening at the end of the slide as investors got confidence in a new management team. Okay, that narrowed the discount. So anyone who got in before that discount narrowed will have had a kicker on their returns that isn't available from an open-ended fund. Why not? Because with an open-ended fund, the NAV and the value of the fund are directly linked uh, through the valuation process. Okay, one other way of looking at discounts and premiums and asset value, just going to mention it here. If you're the kind of person who looks at companies, NAV is also important, but the jargon changes. When you're looking at um, companies, people tend to talk about price to book, the market capitalization of the company compared to the book value of its assets. But it's a very similar principle at work here. So you get price to book ratios, as they're called, below one. And that's the equivalent of saying a discount to NAV. For some investors, that's a sign of a bargain. Great, I can buy this thing for less than, in theory, it's actually worth. A PB above one, comparing the two numbers. All right, so you've got, say, a market capitalization of 200 million and a book value of assets of only 100 million. So literally, the price is above the book. A premium to NAV, less of a bargain. Maybe the fund's getting a little bit expensive. But in fairness, care is required. You shouldn't just go shopping for funds that are trading at discounts to NAV or low price to books in the concepts of the company without understanding why. It might be you're buying a dud rather than a bargain. So care is required before you just dive in, as with all ratios. Now, that's fairly fast. So for other information on some of the stuff I've just talked about, I'm taking some knowledge for granted in this video. What were open and closed-ended funds? That'll give you a bit more background on the two styles I talked about. Um, ETFs and hedge funds, once you've done that first video, quite useful add-ons there. And for more on balance sheets, because I gave you literally a minuscule snapshot for the purposes of this video, balance sheet basics, quite a nice one. 
Any questions, comments, or requests for future videos, I'm editor at killick.com.